Hi, everybody. How are you? Welcome. We're very excited to have you here and to everybody that's um, in our forum upstairs and our room next door. Um, thank you for joining us, too. Um, we are extremely fortunate to have Bob Iger and Graydon Carter here on what's a very busy um, week for them. So thank you to both of them. Graydon, as you know, is the editor of Vanity Fair. It's a position that he has held since 1992. That Vanity Fair remains as compelling and relevant and widely read um, as it does today in an era dominated by digital media is a testament, Graydon, I think, to your stewardship of the brand and to your editorial leadership. Um, you just know what you are getting when you read a Vanity Fair story and when you pick up the magazine, which I have um, in a shameless sales pitch. This, everyone, is a magazine. <laughs> We buy them, or we used to buy them at places called newsstands. Um, I highly recommend you buy this one um, and all the others that come out year round. So Graydon, as you may know, had a distinguished career as a journalist before he got to Vanity Fair. He co-founded, sort of, kind of, co-founded Spy Magazine, wrote for Time Magazine, and was editor of the New York Observer, and he also co-authored a book what We've Lost, a critical examination of the Bush administration. He's also a prolific producer of documentaries, of a TV film that won a Peabody and won an Emmy and a Broadway play starring Bette Midler. Oh yeah, and he also owns three restaurants. <laughs> Graydon ultimately is at what? Yes, go ahead. You want to co add? Co-owns. Okay. <laughs> co-owns, co-owns, all right. Um, it, it's immense to be here on such a busy week um, and a good friend to share your time with us. As you all know, he hosts um, the hottest ticket party in Hollywood, which is a media phenomenon in his own right um, on Oscar night. He's also joined um, by Anna Carter, uh, his wife. So say hello to Anna and join me in welcoming uh, Anna here today. I'm super lucky today because I got to have my husband Bob come join us here and it's the first time that I was actually able to give him a tour of the media center and as I said I've graduated Serena Cha now lets me do the tours on my own. Um, Bob as you know is the CEO and chairman of the Walt Disney Company. Uh, obviously the world's largest media company. He has been there for over a decade, which I can't quite believe, um, at a time of enormous explosive growth at the company and, and has been on quite a role with acquisitions, Marvel, Pixar, Lucasfilm, among them. And he also sits on the Apple board. But what is most relevant, I think, to our conversation today is that he is a huge Vanity Fair fan. He's one of those people who gets excited when this thing comes in the mail. He eagerly You're reads it. <laughs> You're the only one left. And even if he's already, <laughs> even if he has already um, skimmed it on the iPad app, um, and probably sent Graydon a few emails giving him some pointers about how to improve such app. Bob is going to be conducting this conversation with Graydon today. We are going to save time for your questions at the end, and we're going to skedaddle out of here when it's over, because uh, Sarah Benet Weiser um, has an event um, with Andy Zelzer from Bitch Media. I kind of like that we have Condé Nast and Bitch Media sharing the stage all in one night here at the Annenberg School. So we're going to hightail it out of here. One final introduction before I get off this, the stage is um, Brian Grazier. Um, the Academy Award winning producer and, and co-founder of Imagine Entertainment who happens to be a Vanity Fair contributor this month because his book, The Curious Mind, is excerpted in that same issue. So on that note, I'm getting off the stage. I should let you know that we had a prep session last night um, that got pretty heated and, and uh, pretty sizzly. Now, of course, the red wine had nothing to do with it, but I'm here with the mic down in case I need to interrupt or intervene, and off you go. Thank Thanks. you both, and Thanks, welcome. Will. Thank you. Nice to be here. So we thought we would just have, I guess what we're billing as a conversation. Uh, our roles are mildly reversed. I never interview people. I'm often interviewed. And you're rarely interviewed. You may, I, you may interview occasionally. I do very few interviews. You do? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're fish out of water yeah, here in these roles. But uh, we do have a lot in common, aside from, I think, our love of Vanity Fair. We've both been in, I guess, what one would consider maybe somewhat unkindly the traditional media business for 
decades. Will mentioned I've been at Disney for 10, uh, 10 years. I've been in the, uh, this role for 10. I've been at um, ABC and Disney for over four decades, which is hard to believe. And uh, Graydon has been in the magazine business for almost the same amount of time, too. And we were c comparing notes a bit and remarking that in that period of time, we've seen r rather considerable change in the media landscape. I guess that's an understatement. But what's also interesting is that we've probably seen more change in the businesses that we're in in the last maybe five years than we had maybe in the first 35 years of our careers. So I thought I would start by talking about the business of magazines and a magazine in today's world um, and how you, you look at it. In other words, how, how would you describe both from a, um, a content perspective but also from a media perspective what Vanity Fair is today? I mean, we, we tell our advertisers that it is um, sort of a biography of our age, uh, one month at a time, and um, that one month at a time becomes far more difficult as over the last 10, 15 years. Um, we used to compete against, you know, weeklies and dailies, and now we compete against hourlies on the internet, and it's, I think it's uh, much tougher for dailies and weeklies now. I have the, the I can choose, I can sit back, I don't jump on a story. It's the one thing I've learned in this job. Don't jump on a story. Sit back for seven days or so and see how the scrum takes care of it and where they're going to go with it. And so I, there's a luxury, in other words. And I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to make uh, uh, the, the best of a bad situation. And, you know, uh, books make news when they come out. So we're sort of halfway between that the first, you know, onslaught on a story and a book. So uh, we'll put out a story that will say something happens right now. Um, our story probably would be in the July or August issue if we jump, if we do it, not jump on it, but if we do it. So it, uh, and I, you know, you try to go for stories that have legs that, and we have, we have a unique uh, situation. We have a one issue that we produce in New York that goes around the world. I mean, we sell it in Australia and the Far East and Africa and throughout Europe. So it's got to appeal not only just to New Yorkers and, um, and people in Southern California, but uh, a global audience and so you do your best and and, um, um, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't and you know immediately when it doesn't. Is it a, is it a physical, is it physical media? No, how, how important is it that it exists in, in, um, in atoms instead of bits? I know it exists both because you, your app is a, a damn good app but, but how important is it that People get something that they can hand, that they can hold, that they can page turn. There's tactile experience to it. They can look at the pictures, in I guess a slightly different way than they would on a on a mobile device or on a on a laptop or a desktop computer. Well, it's a generational thing, and you know, uh, people our age, you know, we like uh, reading books and we like um, uh, reading newspapers and magazines in physical form. And that's not to say when I travel, I read all my newspapers on an app. Excuse me. By the same token, if you like a, went to a parent's house. Ten years ago, there'd be a big section of Disney, you know, VHS cassette boxes, and then eight years ago, there'd be DVD boxes, and right. now there's nothing. People, it's all streamed. So it, it, it's all it's generational, and uh, our generation still used to sticking something and putting it in something else, and then the iPad, uh, the iPod came along, and you didn't need to put anything in anything. So if you were going to start it today, would you start it with? Something that was physical, or would you go right to something that was distributed digitally? I wouldn't start it today. I don't think it would have a chance. That's an interesting. I was going to ask that question. Um, but I had a magazine. Why? Well, why is that? Because it you couldn't build the. You would never have time to build the business. This magazine lost ninety million dollars in old-fashioned money before it started turning a profit. Um, a magazine like Sports Illustrated it took sixteen years before it turned a profit. Uh, I don't think you could start a magazine of this scale and ever hope to make a profit. The technology will eat it. But the spy magazine, if, which we, a friend and I started in the 1980s, if we started it today, we wouldn't do a, a print version. It would be all online. Yeah, that's interesting. Graydon is lucky in many ways in that he works for a company that is privately controlled or owned. So Cy Newhouse, who's one of the founders of the company, I guess still runs it technically, um, has the ability to uh, fund startups uh, without the public either having to know or needing to know, the public meaning the investor public, 
uh, what the bottom line of that startup is. It's, 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 a, it's an enviable position to be in because I think you were, you were um, I guess, alluding to this in, in many respects, the pressure on new businesses to turn a profit for their investors quickly mm -hmm. is pretty enormous. And to have the luxury of basically years, I guess, of trying to create a product that is right and, and essentially waiting for it to make money in a very patient way is pretty unique. He was very much like, it's funny, his father, Cy Newhouse, he's in his mid-80s now, and he's been a wonderful person to work for. He's like my father, and he, he cherishes magazines. He loves magazines. He loves editors. And he made you feel like a partner rather than an employee. But his father uh, bought the company in 1959. His father was the publisher of the Staten Island Advance. He came home to see his wife, Mitzi Newhouse, and he said, I bought your favorite magazine. And she says, what? He says, Vogue. And she said, you mean a copy? He said, no, I bought the magazine. And she said, how much did you pay for it? He said, I paid uh, $500,000 for it. And he goes back to the, it had, there was three other magazines attached to it at the time. He goes back to the office the next morning. He realized he'd made a mistake. He'd actually paid $5 million for it. <laughs> it was still the $5 million great dollars that he, he spent on it. And they, but they, that was their attitude that they, they, they treated, they loved magazines. And I don't think you can have a company or a, anything unless the owner loved, or the people who run it love the thing that comes out of the factory floor. If, you know, Jack Welch loved light bulbs and jet engines. So come back, I want to come back to something you mentioned earlier, which had to do with the pace of your storytelling or the timing, the market of a story, and how you protect its relevance. So you have an idea today to do a story for Vanity Fair, and you said it ends up on, in the magazine three, four months later, five months later. So you actually have to think, and I imagine a lot of the ideas you have or your writers have are stories that feel topical or relevant mm -hmm. that day. Right. So you have to think about what the world is going to look like as it affects that story many months later. Yeah, you make it sound more scientific than it is, but um, yeah. You just hope that it will be? Yes. <laughs> That's a luxury, too. There's how no textbook. Often are you, so, well, give, us, so give me an example of that. Well, there's a story in this magazine about Sony and the hacking yes. problem that they had. Okay, so that, that you know, up until Christmas time, that's in the newspaper and online every second of every day. And I assigned one writer to his Mark Seal. And I do believe that uh, we were talking last night that a great magazine story, a great newspaper story, uh, a great documentary should have access, narrative, disclosure. Access meaning it's accessible to a... No, access, you're, you're, you're close in. You're, you're okay. talking to principals or you're near principals. Narrative in, in the fact that there's a story here, it doesn't just end abruptly. Um, uh, disclosure and the fact that you're going to release information that was not known before. And personally, I like uh, uh, stories with conflict. Um, uh, otherwise, they can be quite static. And uh, it, I don't mean just, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat, or, or, but it just, it's something where there's two forces rubbing up against each other. So, go back, though, to the idea of timing the market. You're, you, so you said it's not scientific. Obviously, there are stories in your magazines that are somewhat, not evergreen, but where the timing isn't as yeah. important. And some, there are. Mm -hmm. So is there an example of something you did that was big, where you put a fair amount of resources on a story, and by the time it ended up in the magazine, in today's world, which can just inundate people with information and perspective on a subject, that it's just, no, that it's just been done by the time it comes out? Any, Usually, at it's some over. point in the reporting process, the reporter will know if what everybody else is doing on this thing. Um, I had five writers working on, uh, three editors working on a story about Edward Snowden, which to me is one of the stories of our day. And they spent six or seven months on it. It took um, two and a half months to edit the thing. We took 20 pages in the magazine. And, you know, he, he was on, he was Skyped on TV on NBC you know, day before our thing came out. And, uh, and we had him for the story too. But it, um, I thought, yeah, the timing is still fine. The fact is Citizen Four came out a year after the, um, uh, the, the initial release of documents and, uh, or two years after the release of the documents. So it, the in a certain way, if you do it sort of in a, an okay job uh, and you stick to your beliefs, of what makes a great story, and it, it is that it, the timeliness is, is fine. But then, obviously, 
So your role as an editor versus the role of a writer, you're relying on a writer. Yes. What to, so let's take a step back in terms of the genesis of a story and how it unfolds and then ultimately what your role is versus the with the writer as it ends up in the magazine. So to what extent are you pitched ideas by writers that work for you or that are freelance and to what extent do you pitch ideas to writers that work for you or you have relationships? Well, it's with? funny. I have five writers who work on staff who used to be editors of magazines and they're terrific at story well, ideas. Only five? Well, no, you have They used to be editors of individual oh, magazines. I see. Five of them were and editors. They're really good at story ideas and a, a lot of great writers who work for me and I assume for others just are terrible at story ideas. But once you get them on their on, the, on something that appeals to them that you might have suggested, they just go away and run with it. And um, uh, the funny thing, well, there's one, um, the thing is your, an editor's job is to basically um, talk to a writer and a photographer and make them think this is the most important thing they will ever do. And then turn around three months later and make them think that's the most important thing they will ever do. So you pitch ideas to them, they pitch ideas yeah. to you. It yeah. depends sometimes yeah. on the writer. Yeah, I'm good at ideas. And I mean, that's, once, that's one of my strengths. So to what your involvement, the fact that it's a monthly magazine gives you the luxury of spending a lot of time on each piece of it, yes. I assume, as yeah. opposed to something that's happening daily or yes. weekly. Yes. So your fingerprints, in a, you know, in a good sense, are all over. For better or worse, yes. Everything? Yeah, everything, every, every layout, single thing. Everything, headline, every picture, picture yes. everything. Everything. That's interesting. Yes. And, um, so you're, as an editor, because most, a lot of editors don't create anything. They just edit. They lend perspective. In a way, you're a creator, too. Well, all that, editors craft a, a world of, for their magazines. Weekly magazines report on the week that happened. Daily newspapers largely report on the day that happened previous to that. And monthly magazines have to create their own world. So if you look at most monthly magazines, they have a worldview, and their stories slot into that worldview. Okay, talk about the commerce side. Oh, yeah, actually, before I go to that, one thing that hit me, maybe some interesting perspective. When um, I became CEO of Disney, we had had a considerable um, uh, problem, I guess, a big problem with our animated movies for a while. They, they basically were not very good. And um, they were a lot worse than that. Um, and I, we had had a relationship with Pixar that was ending, and I tried to resurrect it, which resulted in us buying Pixar. But one of the things I discovered when I went to Pixar to figure out how do they make animated films that are so great, and how do we make films that weren't, is that their animated films all came from the head of a director. So every Pixar film that's been made, the idea for the film, the story itself, was created by the director of the film. So there was a passion that that director had, not just an appreciation for the storytelling, for the characters, for the place, for the, for the conflict that ultimately we end up in the film, but for the entire project that lived throughout the project. And, and the result, as I have now seen it and learned about it, is far different than when you pitch an idea to a director and say, it's my idea, I love it, but you go off and you make it. It just, there's a lack of mm -hmm. connectivity or I guess, again, passion is the best word. And after we bought Pixar, uh, the guys who were running Pixar, John Lasseter in particular, came down to run Disney Animation, turned everything around to Disney Animation by saying, we're only going to make films at Disney Animation who come from the, head, who's come from the heart and the head of the directors, the stories. And the result, I mean, Frozen is one example of that. I guess that's a pretty good one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's just interesting listening to you because is there a different, is there, you're saying there are some writers that just aren't capable of pitching great ideas, but they're great at writing stories, yes. even if it's someone else's yeah, idea. Yes. I guess that's well, certainly true. Talk, there talk, are assignment desks and newspapers. Yeah. And, so, but you talk it through, and the fact is it becomes a, both your idea at the same time. There's one well, There's writer, a skill to that, too. Well, there's a skill in the editor to get them off their idea, and there's, I, I have this technique I, uh, that I've, I've used a couple times, so the writer will come in and say, they'll give an idea that I think is not going to hold up, is not a great one. I say, you know, that's a great idea, but that, if, you're a, if you're a writer who hits doubles, it'd be perfect for you. But you're a home run hitter, <laughs> and you should never step up to the, the plate without expecting to at least have a chance at a home run, and that's not a home run for you. So, Even if you do the best job in the world at it. That's interesting. So com the commerce side of it, what 
it, not the nuts and bolts of the economics of the magazine business, but what sells magazines today? How do you, and I want to get back to how you stay relevant as a magazine and as Vanity Fair in today's world, but I'm curious. I, I mentioned this to you last night at dinner. How important is the cover? I looked at covers of Vanity Fair for the last many years and discovered that there are many actors and actresses, some musicians, a couple of uh, members of royal families, some <laughs> notable <laughs> recent ones, although Princess Diana, yeah, yeah. some Kennedys, some Kennedys, and yeah. uh, a couple of Obamas. But by yeah. and large, you draw from uh, uh, the art, the, the arts, particularly movie, particular mm -hmm. movies, and some television. Does that? Does the cover matter? Well, actually, less, less and less. And the, the fact is, if you have a global magazine, the only international language is, are the movies. Every, every country has its own musical stars and its own television stars and sports stars. But you we, choose we, a cover, so it's a global, it's a global cover. That goes, that goes globally. And um, the fact is, so that's the magazine interesting in terms of the getting, choice. Well, magazines, nothing sells that well because there are no newsstands anymore. There used to be 300 companies that distributed magazines in this country, and there are two left. There, you know, the post office, meanwhile, this drives me crazy. The post office is expected to turn a profit. I'm going to say, start with the de Department of Defense. Let them see them make a profit first. <laughs> but the fact is, the post office is a service we all use, you know, and, and it's a lifeblood if you live out in the, uh, in the hinterland. And the fact is that, they're, you know, they're getting squeezed, squeezed, squeezed. So it's just harder and harder to get magazines into people's hands. So the cover is far less important than it was eight years ago. Because you're not expecting people to walk by a newsstand, there aren't newsstands. see a cover of yes. George Clooney and say, oh, I got to have that yes. magazine. Right. I see. So uh, what does, so how, I mean, talk about how, how you keep it relevant, which obviously has to, I'm sure has to do with storytelling choices, but are there other things? In other words, how on the culture does it have to be? How, you know, we, today's world, I mean, if I see another picture, I'm not going to name names, but... Oh, go ahead. You no, know, but mean, the, the so-called tabloid press uh, yeah, yeah, today yeah. covers... I'm convinced there are six people that they cover. Yes. Five of them are Kardashians. <laughs> yes, yeah. Right? And, that, and it's constant. It's constant. Yeah. So, but... That's not well. We have a fair. no Kardashian rule, which was an easy rule. We never. By the way, nothing against them. It's a no, no. I no. give them a lot of credit yeah. for, the, for the attention that they get. But, yeah. But again, so there's this world that wants to know what everybody wore to some uh, big to the Grammys like the other night, and who's making what movie, and who's getting having an affair with whom, or divorcing whom, and what, whatever it is. What, so what's the secret sauce here that... I don't, there's no secret sauce. I mean, I, it's Just funny. make it great? Uh, just, um, you know, if it interests you, like I have my own loves. I like canoeing and love fishing, but I don't have a canoeing column and I don't have a fishing <laughs> column. And we do no studies and you just... No research? Nothing. And, um, great. So it's just, it, if it, it's your... Um, Ted Turner used to say, say my textbook is the seat of my pants. And that's the way it is for most editors. And it's just if it, if it appeals to you, and you have, you have a rough idea of your reader, so some of the Catholic interest is getting on a plane for eight hours, that's the closest thing to sort of research. Can I ask you a question? Sure. So my my th thing is, I remember reading years ago that Disney um, Disney picked up kids when they were like two and a half, three years old, and then Disney lost them about eleven, and that was that a conscious effort to fill in all those things so you carry the, the two and a half year old to the point where they're, they're parents themselves and with movies all along the way? There's a yes and no to that. There was a time in our history, not that long ago, maybe about a decade ago, when there was a belief that the world had changed so much that there was a, that age compression uh, was a factor, meaning kids were aging out of the demogra Disney demographic at a much younger age. It was particularly true, we found, in um, Western European countries and in the United States, UK in particular. So whereas in, when, when I was a kid, you, as, a, as a boy, you might have lived with Disney and its storytelling until you were 10, boys in modern world, as we knew it, or the Western world, were aging out of Disney at five. And girls, we used to keep till they were 12 or 13, and now it was 10. And so the company had made an effort to start making more non-Disney things because they felt they couldn't keep kids interested. And yeah, they knew by the time they became parents or grandparents, they'd get them back. But there were some pretty big gaps, and there was just a belief that we couldn't possibly make things that were relevant to 
the people in those gaps. And um, I didn't really want to believe that. Um, and we didn't do research really on it, except we knew, we did research on who our, our consumers were, but we didn't have, ever ask people what they wanted. I'm not a big believer in that. I don't think you really get the truth anyway, because it's such an artificial circumstance. And it's art artificial in terms of results. Um, and the decision that we made is let's just try to, let's just be better at what we're making. Um, I didn't, I was asked often whether we should change our standards. Should we allow more violence? Um, should we open up the dialogue, the Disney dialogue to saucier language, as a, for instance? And I actually believe we really did not have to change the standards at all. We just had to be, we just had to get better. We had to make things that were, I don't know, had a, just sharper, um, not necessarily more sophisticated, just more likable. And some of that was changing a brand of humor. Some of that was making characters just a little bit more realistic, although you'd have to argue you haven't run into anybody that reminded you of Anna or Elsa like recently, so that's not very realistic. Um, and it worked. It, it worked. Now, we, you know, you're not going to get too many USC students who are watching Disney movies, unless they're studying film, probably. Um, but we keep people longer than we used to. So Marvel, Pixar? Yes, well, the, we, the company rounded itself out in terms of our other assets. Pixar was different. Pixar's audience is slightly more sophisticated. Part of that is the nature of their storytelling and their characters. Marvel and uh, Lucasfilm, which is Star Wars and Pixar and, um, and ESPN, they were done because we thought they were good businesses, not because we wanted a cradle-to-grave consumer. I don't think that that's pot The world is just too complex too diverse to really to really do that. I don't know if I've totally answered the question, yeah. but um, but it, t what I love today about Disney is I do see multi generations. Actually, I'm one of them because I'm Willow and I have boys who are 16 and 12, and they're at 16 and 12. They're kind of out of the Disney demographic a bit, uh, but we have grandchildren too, and they're smack in it. And so you're interest interestingly enough. You became more of a Disney fan when, when the two of you had a little girl. No, I was a always girl. a Disney fan because I have five kids and oh, that's we true. went through the whole stream of them. So. But I love seeing parents and grandparents, but I like making things that they love too, mm -hmm. not just because they have kids or grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And that's a little different. We're trying to, actually going all the way back to Walt Disney's day, he tried to make things. He was asked once, Walt, who do you make your movies for? Do you make them for kids? And you're making for little girls, who is it? And uh, he said, I make it for that special spot that exists in everybody's heart. In other words, he wasn't making it for people. He was making it to touch people's hearts in some form. And I think if you, can, if you do that, if you can achieve that, your audience is much broader mm -hmm. without changing any standards. Mm -hmm. Well, Disney used to be considered sort of square in the, fact, the way that Tex Avery and Warner Brothers cartoons were sort of yeah. hipper and inside jokes and, and, uh, and Disney movies were considered square in those days. And they're not considered square anymore. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. I think there are a lot of people that might consider them square. I, I don't, we don't make them to be hip or square or anything. We just try to make them to be good. Now, can we, can we go back to can you? Can we talk about Frozen? <laughs> no. Can we talk about Frozen on Ice, which we saw? The frozen on <laughs> Ice, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> frozen dresses. Yeah. yeah. Frozen theme park attractions. Yeah. Frozen ice cream. Yeah. Uh, Lost my train of thought. We're, okay. Um, long form versus short form and going back to what media looks like today. Um, everything seems to be getting shorter in terms of storytelling. I, uh, not long ago, not to bring it back to Disney, but we decided we want to f create an initiative to make Mickey Mouse more relevant to young people. And one of the things that we did was we looked at the... 60 to 70 shorts that Walt Disney had made starting in the late 20s going all the way through the 50s of Mickey Mouse and we thought well maybe we'll bring them, we'll dust them off and bring them back. So we looked at them all, we could not believe how long they were. They felt like mini-series actually and they were eight, nine minutes long. So we then had a big discussion about well could we make, the, could we actually cut Walt's shorts and we decided he wouldn't complain and we would. So we reduced them all to about three minutes in length and redid the music track and brought them out. And they were good, but not great, because they were still too long. And now we're making originals that are probably about a minute and a half to two minutes. 
And if you look at, obviously, YouTube generation, BuzzFeed, wherever you look, Vine, you can get even shorter, and Instagram, everything seems to be shorter. But your publication, which has some short little bites here and there, and you mentioned um, the Snowden piece, which was 20 pages long. What about long form, long form journalism, long form writing, I guess, when you think long form, you can take it into the book category, but let's keep it at magazines and newspapers. And is long form a, a dying uh, no, art? No, I don't think, and funny, if, if, if uh, in, in, in the wrong hands of photo caption, you can get bogged down halfway through a 200 word photo caption. In a great hands, a 30 page magazine article ends before you know it. And the great thing is about today, there's, there's, there's a lot of problems in, in, in conventional media now. But for young people, for the first time in history, not since the 18th century, you, they, you have the chance of owning the means of production. The fact is anybody with talent and, um, and drive uh, can create a website or a blog. And the fact is that is, was impossible years ago. Well, so we, you're saying that the, the, there's a much more fertile ground for developing the writers of the future? It, well, for today? writers developing themselves if, if they want. It's harder to get... Notice when, when we started Spy Magazine in 1986, and it was a satirical monthly about New York City and, and Southern California, and we'd uh, gone through, a, done a projection that we thought we needed about $750,000 to, to do it and to launch it. And we uh, had an advisor, George Hirsch, who was uh, then president of The New Yorker, and he said, look, just double that and double it again. So we raised $3.5 million, which is a lot of money back in those days. And you know the six-year mark, we ran out. And if the you fact, ran out of money, we ran, we ran out of money, and partly because we, we were uh, we we're more successful than we planned. Because you send magazines out to the newsstand, you have to pay to print them now, but you don't get the check back from that sale for 120 days. You know, advertisers take 60 to 90 days to pay you. So your money, you're paying up front for your printing and your writing and everything like that. But all the other money is coming in much later, and we found that we were printing many more magazines than we had ever planned. We had planned to sort of um, roll it out the way, the platform, the way movies used to be before, uh, you know, Jaws and Star Wars. And, but the fact is that magazine could be done for $40,000 today. If you have like-minded people and, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, basically we had like a few editors and about 30 unpaid assists, or we paid them $50 a week, interns. It was, like a, it was like a galley of slaves, I mean, basically. Okay, so let's talk um, more, uh, t I guess, uh, topical or newsworthy, starting with um, the Brian Williams story, speaking of journalism. Is that a Vanity Fair story? Well, I don't know. You know, I've never seen a, a lynch mob like that, and, and um, uh, he's been taken apart. I, I find him one of the finer people I know. I think he's very good at his job. He's a great family man. He didn't kill anybody. I um, wish journalists had spent much more time examining the people responsible for the 2008 financial crisis. But he, it only works for us at a certain point when the story is about to change and where, say, Brian is part of that story. And um, Brian's part of it, meaning he's a protagonist in a uh, positive way in the change yes, of the story as yes. opposed to a negative way. Yes. That's, and um, To what extent, so you have... I mean, part of it has to do with how long you've uh, been doing this, and, but your contacts and, and the magazine that you run, you have unbelievable connections, relationships, tentacles into the world of pop culture and media today. Relationship is where I'm going. How, to what extent does the people, you, the fact that you know someone get in the way of covering them? Well, you know, How do you I, manage that? I lost a, a for temporarily a good friend, uh, John Scanlon, who was a famous old PR man in, the, in New York and worked for the Lindsay administration and was a legend, a big Falstaffian figure. And he got wrapped up in the Brown and Williams tobacco uh, situation, in which we did a, a 15,000 word story on that. And you remember there was a whistleblower who said that, you know, tobacco's strange enough is not good for you. And, um, and we didn't speak for a while. And, and um, but by the same token, I remember we, 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 at Spy Magazine, we used to, I interviewed Donald Trump for a, um, a magazine article before we started Spy, and I noticed that his hands were really very small. So we uh, called him a short-fingered vulgarian, which has driven him crazy for the last 30 years. And Larry Tesh, Larry Tesh buys, Larry, Larry Tesh, 
<laughs> I just don't want to show you my fingers. I swear to God, this. <laughs> I don't know if they're short or not, but I don't, I don't feel like putting them on display. Every six months, <laughs> he'll send me a photograph of his hands in some situation. <laughs> I swear, circled with gold with Sharpie ink, showing me how long his short fingers are. <laughs> when, when, we, we had, the, we did, uh, when Larry Tish bought CBS, he started like slashing budgets and killing the, uh, the, 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 uh, the newsroom. And we did a story on it, and I called him a, a, um, a dwarf billionaire, churlish dwarf billionaire. So John Scanlon, the same friend who worked for the Brown and Williams, he called me up, and I got a lot of this in those days. He said, Graydon, you've gone too far. And so I was just on the phone talking to him, and he said, you know, look, first of all, Larry is not technically a dwarf. So I just wrote that down. <laughs> So we corrected the next month. I said we got it on very good authority that Larry Tish is not technically a dwarf. Do you ever have issues with um, advertisers? Uh, for instance, I know you don't take cigarette ads, but I don't know if you were to do a story today on General Motors and the issues that they've had. Oh, we would do that. You, you just tell them you just give them a heads and up. And you have a say, church and state, so if yeah. the CEO of General Motors called and says, I spend, I don't know how many millions of dollars on full-page color ads in your magazine and on your apps, how could you possibly do this to us? We're going to pull all of our ads. That's happened. We lost all the tobacco advertising and for go, four and years. You, but you go for it. It's, you never, you, know, you don't draw a line. I mean, I don't do it just like to be, you know, naughty or anything like that. But it, we would give them a heads up. They wouldn't be in that issue. Uh, we've lost tobacco advertising. We've lost car advertising or over certain things. And, you know, I'm a pretty good relationship with my advertisers. I write them a thank you note every, every single month. They're giving us $80,000 a page. It's what pays for everything we do. And I thank each one of them every single month. And I have for 22 years. Hmm. So this week, big week, because of Oscars and the Vanity Fair party, as Willow mentioned, um, is one of the big events of the week. Is important for the magazine to have a presence here this week? No, it's, it's obviously a, it's business. It's not just social. Yeah. I, I, get, I mean, it, yeah, yes and no. I mean, we, I started this after Swifty died, and he, I'd been to his. Swifty is Swifty so, Lazar. Swifty Lazar, who had a, who had famous, a famous post Oscar yes, party. Yeah, I know, and Kern. They watch it during the Oscars, and then people came after. And, um, and then, I, you know, we started it on a whim, and it was very small because I thought we might fail, so I thought best to fail in a small room rather than a big room. And, uh, and I'm personally, my wife will attest to this, very anxious at cocktail parties. It's not my thing. So I, uh, I've learned over the years how to get through the evening and, uh, and try to, but I like the planning of it. There's a structure going up across from uh, Beverly Hills City Hall, a big, huge structure we're building for this. And it's a big, it's a big business for us. And it- Because um, it's sponsored? We don't have a sponsor. We never do that. It's just, it, but there's, um, we, we um, we get a lot of support from the advertising community for this issue and for that thing. So, nice. it, um, and it's very stressful and um, and a lot. I'm surprised how many people are going to be in Southern California next weekend. I you have know. to say no to a lot of people. You Does say, everybody call you and say I got to get. Oh yeah, in. no, no, yeah. Because if I don't, I'm no longer relevant. And what happens? No, I try to be as kind as possible. My staff tries to lot let me near this because I'm such a soft touch. They try to like get it before it gets to me and. Um, but I'm, you know, I, we do the best we can on case by case basis. All right, I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. If I'm not. Do, too, do you want to? Let's see how this goes. Yet, hey, hey, Bob. Yes. You want to take questions? Yes, I was just going to do that. I okay. was just going to take questions. Uh, I'm going to help you because I have the microphone. It's Go true for power it. in this couple. Thanks. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, I'm going to. Actually, Graydon, I was going to ask you coping strategies to get through the evening. Uh, preferred uh, uh, a beta blocker uh, <laughs> I, took, I took one before i came here and uh beta blocker don't drink liquor because it tires you out drink champagne it actually keeps you going all night i gotta take notes yeah and uh yeah don't look at anybody and don't look at anyone in the eye because then you have to have a conversation <laughs> Hi. Hi. um so i'm john taplin i run the annenberg innovation lab um this question is for both of you Graydon, you mentioned that you would never start a magazine like this today. And I assume partially that's because in 2000, newspaper revenues, for instance, were in the $65 billion range, and today they're $15 billion. And Google's revenues were $1 billion, and today they're $66 billion. And Bob, I've just happened to Google 
watch Avengers online free just before it came over here and on Google. Not the, as long as it's not the new Avengers. <laughs> That's coming out in May. <laughs> so on Google, you know, Mega, Share, and Solar, yeah. the, all the pirate sites are the top things that come up. So do either of you think that Google could be more supportive of the creative community? Um, and have you ever you've talked to them about that? Because obviously something is going on with the way that they push everybody to pirate sites and stuff. Like that. Talk to them a lot about it over the years because we felt at times that they're more a facilitator um, and that the uh, distribution of pirated goods really has no real uh, um, value to society. Now you could argue that everyone's access to things for free is a great thing, but artists are not getting paid for that. People who invested money in the creation are not getting paid. Even the state is not getting paid because no taxes are being paid on the transaction. And I would say over time, Google has uh, learned to become a little bit more uh, receptive to our plea. Um, it's still complicated because of the, vol the sheer volume of pirated material that exists. Uh, but um, there are mechanisms that enable us to have Google take down pirated material. Now it is what we call whack-a-mole, where you take it down one place and it pops up another and so on and so on. But there's a, there's a, continued, a continual dialogue Interestingly enough, as they've gotten a little bit closer into the content business, they're not necessarily making things, but they're a little bit closer to it than they used to be. They've gotten a little bit more sensitive about it. But it's an issue. Now, it's, less, it's a big issue in the United States. It's even a bigger issue in other parts of the world. I was in India a week and a half ago or two weeks ago, and I told the government there that of the five plus billion movie experiences that existed in India in 2014. That's people either going to a movie theater or watching a movie somewhere. Um, somewhere, than, somewhere in the neighborhood of three and a half billion of them were from pirate, through pirated circumstances. It's just extraordinary. You know, and it's a big movie market. Bollywood is a, is a big business there, but it could be a lot bigger if the government did something about basically protecting it. Artists could make a lot more money. People would invest more in the quality of the films. It would just generally, and the, and the state would gain income and it's desperate for it in the form of taxes on the transaction to help them build schools and roads and better hospitals and you name it. Um, it takes a lot of cooperation, both government and private though, including the creators, because one of the things I talk about a lot in piracy is the best way to combat piracy is put product into the marketplace on a well-timed, well-priced basis. Keeping it out of the marketplace with the technology that exists today and expecting it's going to be protected is an almost an impossibility. Hi, I'm uh, David Craig in the Annenberg School. I'm, I'm wondering about Vanity Fair's brand extensions. Are you currently exploring those opportunities? You have Esquire now with the cable network, New York Times kind of stumbled and fell with theirs, but um, are you looking at opportunities to expand the brand into other platforms? I mean, um, yeah, um, yes and no. We have a very healthy website, um, uh, very healthy website, and um, you know you, you can. Uh, these things don't always work, and I'm in the opinion like we've been offered TV shows in the past, and and I always thought, why put your the company you work for in the position where somebody else can cancel you? So um, uh, we'll do it, but in slow ways. Then none of these things bring in. Uh, as much money as say the, the advertising does. Well, what, th this actually is very profitable, and will be for many years. I mean, if there's one magazine left on earth, my job is to make sure it's this one, and we're hugely profitable. And you only have so many eyes, and so the more you, um, you spread it thin, um, the um, the greater um, chance you're going to take the eye off the ball of the thing that makes everything happen. If only, if only, yeah. Hello. Um, I was and, and remain a big fan of Christopher Hitchens uh, in Vanity Fair. And I'm wondering, is there anything so crazy that he pitched to you that you were like, no, Hitch, no way? No, uh, he was, uh, first of all, he, I miss Christopher Hitchens every day. He died about six years ago. 
And um, at one point, we set him on a, um, Christopher was slightly shambolic, and I remember one point he went through a bad patch. He'd gotten into a fight with a White House um, staffer, and it was on the news every night, and Christopher might have been in the right, might have been the wrong, but he looked looking very ragged on TV, so I brought him to New York. And I said, look, let's, let's get, he needs a new suit. And so we got, a, we got the, my fashion department to get him some clothes, and they looked at his shoes, and they were sort of all old and scuffed, and they said, well, we're going to get you some shoes. What size do you take? He goes, I don't know. They said, well, what do you mean? Oh, no. He says, these are borrowed. And that was Christopher. He, could, he would go show up with, somewhere with borrowed shoes. Yeah. And um, he, at one point we put him on a, a voyage of sort of self-improvement. And he went through various things. He went through he got proper dental care and got his nails done and a suit made for him. And then at one point, somebody suggested he, he, he get waxed. And, he, and I said, you know, I, I just heard about this the other day, but there's something called the back, the crack, and the sack. <laughs> And so he's sitting opposite me, looking much like you are right now. <laughs> and, you know, he just said, in for a penny, in for a pound. He said, he said it was worse than being waterboarded. Well, that's right. He was waterboarded. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Hamda, and um, I happened to read prior to coming here that you were a libertarian, so you don't support either party, so how do you address um, stories when people come to pitch ideas that are very right-wing or very left-wing? No, I'm actually, the, I'm a libertarian, I was a libertarian on one issue, and that was smoking in New York. I thought, I have a lot of friends who smoke, I smoke occasionally, and I thought, restaurants in, up in Connecticut where we spend the weekends, they have a smoking room and a non-smoking room, and I got into Mike Bloomberg was a friend of mine, but we got into a huge public fight over this, and I was very libertarian on that issue, partly because he didn't announce that before he ran. This was a big surprise once he got into office, and it changed the lives of a lot of people, and it made New York less fun, <laughs> a lot less fun. I remember, by the way, um, Graydon, as Will mentioned, owns a couple of, or co-owns a couple of really cool restaurants, and years back, before a really new Graydon, Willow and I decided to have a nice dinner at one of the restaurants. And I'm a staunch anti-smoker. Uh, I can't stand the smell of smoke, actually. I, I just react viscerally to it. And we went to the restaurant. We got a great seat next to Graydon and his family, and Graydon was smoking. That's no, 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 <laughs> like that. With friends, We have maybe. got to leave. <laughs> we have got to leave this restaurant. <laughs> you didn't actually know that it was Graydon. All of a sudden, we smelled the smoke. We've so got to get up. We've got to, we peek over the booth, and it's Graydon. Right. Yeah. What are we going to do? It's the owner of the restaurant. <laughs> Civil disobedience. Mary. Mary's the best. She gets a sprint. Okay, good. So you both talked about your different organizations being in a state of complete flux. And what I want to know is what is the role of a leader in a situation like this where you have writers and editors and future journalists who are just so crazed about will they have jobs and Bob you have producers and writers and all kinds of people who are so worried and actors are, are we going to have jobs so what what is the role of a leader You're better at this than i am <laughs> uh you know I mean, in my case we have 175,000 employees so i think my role in many respects is different um in different parts of the organization different people but as the CEO of the company, I like to think that I have primarily three responsibilities. I, I have to kind of define what the company is, which essentially results in what assets we keep and what assets we sell and what assets we buy. Sort of what is, what is Disney? It's, you know, we co consider it a high quality entertainment company. Um, second, I, I'm responsible for creating a strategy. And in our case, the strategy is threefold, meaning there are three primary strategic priorities. Make great things, use technology to make them better, to reach more people, to make the company more efficient, and grow globally. And then the third thing that I have to do as a CEO is create an ethic or a standard for the company that I expect everybody in the company to adhere to. And by the way, it's not just the, the behavior of the people, it's the quality and the integrity of our product as well. So it's those three things. And I'm, I, don't, I'm not a, I don't read textbooks on how to manage, but I've been doing this for a long time, and 
I have a pretty good sense of what kind of value I can bring to the organization through my own brand of leadership. On top of all that, which I think is what you're alluding to, is when you're managing in the, dyna in the dynamic world that we're managing in today, which is ever-changing, rapid change, right in front of our eyes all the time, one of the things I think is really important is a steady, is one, identify the change. Do not uh, try in any way to uh, will it away by ignoring it, because you're not going to do that. It's like technology. You could argue all you want that technology is a disruptive force. It's more challenge than it is opportunity. But you, you, no matter how much you complain about it, it's not going away. So I'm a big believer in identify what all the issues are. Do not hide from them. And then when you do, don't be daunted by them. It's kind of a steady as she goes. Not necessarily go in the same direction, but maintain a level of um, sanity, um, uh, not calm per se, because there are times when calm doesn't work. Um, but essentially, don't create an air of panic. I'm, I'm not one, I'm, you'll never hear me say the sky is falling. I'm not Pollyannish about the world, or try, I, but I don't feel that that really motivates people. Instead, I'd like to say, we're faced with unbelievable challenge, unbelievable change, let's figure out the best way to adapt to it and keep going, routine. So my role is essentially to be a creator of calm and peace versus the opposite. Versus the opposite. I toss a few bombs here and there, disruption bombs, but, but I try to do that to motivate people to think about innovation and change and to adapt to change as opposed to anything else. The last thing, sorry, I'm too wordy, but I also talk a lot about how the status quo is not a winning strategy. So that's part of what sort of emanates from my leadership of the, of the company. Uh, everything that Bob said, plus alcohol for, for, for me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The occasional cigarette. No, you know, it's funny uh, that, I mean, I, I wish I had such a plan. I mean, I, the thing is, I do think the great things come out of consistency in a company, and our masthead has not changed much at all over the last quarter of a century. I have seven editors, four of them used to be my assistant, and, and, they, and they all came from different parts. I've worked, some of the people in, I've worked with for 35 years. So we all fin can finish each other's sentence. There's no upheaval ever. And you know, one of my assistants, who if I owned the magazine, I would turn the magazine over to him in a couple of years. He was a bar back at the Royalton Hotel, and he um, he looked like one of my kids, and he had really nice hustle. And and he, the bar back's the guy who replaces the bottles at the back of the bar, and he dropped out of college, and he he's been an absolutely vital part of my life for the last twenty years. But had no journalism experience, never thought of being a journalist ever before. But he's got, he's just got what it takes. You choose. Uh, did you choose? Ooh, Solomon. Okay, Judy Muller, I'm a broadcast professor here at USC. And Bob, this is for you. Um, this is kind of an old fashioned journalism question, but ABC News is owned by Disney, and over the years, do you, do you, have you seen a blurring of entertainment and news? Is Good Morning America really a news show? Um, and is there pressure from Disney, maybe not officially, but to promote Disney films and that sort of thing in the news division? Uh, Multi-pronged question. Uh, Good Morning America is a news show with a heavy entertainment component. Entertainment meaning, you know, subject matter that is, you know, lighter in nature. Not necessarily less relevant, but lighter in nature than the, the typical news story of the day. And if you look at the flow of the show, the beginning of it, particularly the first 20 minutes, is much heavier on the news. But as the, as the, as the program wears on, two hours long, and the audience shifts, which it does, uh, the audience interests actually change too, and GMA has reacted to those audience shifts. What audiences from eight to nine want to want to watch versus seven eight? I'm told are significantly different. That's nothing, by the way, that Disney did. That's their own doing. Uh, on the Disney side, uh, we don't force them to cover anything that is ours. Fortunately, a lot of what we have uh, been making of late is f of interest to them. So, for instance, I, I have a good hunch that. Good Morning America is going to want to cover very closely the making of the Star Wars film and do what it can to leverage the, their involvement with that to help basically improve their or, or to, to serve their audiences better, as a for instance. But we don't order things. We, 
at this point with Disney, we, we find enough ways to get enough attention, either by spending money to market or by using all the different tools from a viral perspective and marketing today that exists to get enough attention for our product. And it's rare that we need to ask them to do something. Uh, they do it because they'd love to be associated with it and it generally works. Um, where, and so I don't think there's a, uh, there isn't a blurring of the lines corporately um, between news and Disney. And I guess whether, you, I think there's a lot of entertainment in news these days. It just depends on what, how it's wrapped and what show it's in. I'm going to let one last question and you're going to, both of you are going to answer it really, really quickly, and then we're going to evacuate this room as if it's like a jetliner on fire so we can all get out. Okay, last question. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming. I'm currently interning at ABC, so this Where is a really... Is oh, there you are. Yeah, hi. <laughs> this is a really cool experience for me. Um, I think that a lot of students out here, I don't know, I am, I'm graduating this year, and it's kind of scary. Do you think that there's a certain skill set that coming from Annenberg we have that we should, you know pitch to you guys when we're applying for jobs, or is there anything that we should really take advantage of while we're here? Uh, you know, media is changing, and we're trying to keep up with it here, so. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of value in classroom experience, and there's a lot of value in practical experience, and I think my sense is that there's an interesting uh, blend here that enables students an opportunity to essentially have a classroom-like experience in a, pr in, a, in a more practical setting. Um, the digital center or media center, I forget what it's called, is a great example of that. Uh, I was actually fortunate. I majored in communications or television and radio, but back in the late 60s and early 70s, so we didn't have anything that looked like this facility. <laughs> I guarantee that. But I benefited a lot from having, showing an interest in, in uh, learning and doing at the same time. And it helped me tremendously. I started at ABC in 1974 as a production assistant. And I walked in with more experience than um, I might have had if I hadn't really applied myself practically while I was in school. And the school that I went to gave me an opportunity to do that. I didn't answer that briefly, but. Graydon, do you want to? Well, no, I just, I think that actually uh, learn how to write. You can, you can get to see almost anybody. At least you can get to letter to almost anybody if it's well done and it has charm and it's honest and uh, it's sort of forthright. I, I guarantee if you can write a great letter, no typos because that'll get eliminated almost immediately, but a really charming letter, you can get in to see anybody. And from there, you have as much a chance as anybody. Thank you both very, very much. Huge, huge thanks. Thank you, to, particularly to you, Graydon.